Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here, and welcome to the channel. Whether you like this guy or not, it is irrelevant. Right now, he's the world's best, and has been for some time. Why? I guess the answer is simple. There is absolutely no one out there who might even come close to him. Anyone who tries it against Magnus fails and fails again. In order to see last time Magnus lost the game, we need to go back somewhere in 2018. But before we go there, Magnus is a very serious chess player, an extremely competitive one. And he won't believe what he said. The Guardian reported right after his game against Fabi, Magnus said if he had lost, it could have been his last World Championship match. How do we know this? Well, here it is, or here. But whether what he said is true or not, it's a different story. The very last time Magnus was beaten was in the Rapid World Championship in St. Petersburg. In round seven, on the 27th of December, in a 66 moves long game by this guy. Can you recognize him or have you seen him before? It is Alexander Zubov. And though some people may know him to be Russian, I'm sure he's not going to be at all happy hearing that. He's Ukrainian and this is for the record. He played and I'm talking about Magnus himself, 59 games without losing. So this in itself is some achievement in its own right. Many GMs, strong GMs, tried it against Magnus. The list is long to mention, each and every one by name. But let me bring up some of the strongest gems Magnus took down. Naka probably is one of the few players Magnus was not able to beat. But let me stick to those who tried and failed. Andre Kin was unsuccessful. Vichy Anand, Firuja, Ivan Popov, Duda, Wang Hao, Mamidiarov, and Anish Giri were beaten. Rapport, Svitla, Navara, and who else? Our Minister of Defense. Grichuk, Levon, Maxim Vashirakrov, and some of these players tried it against Magnus multiple times, but to no avail. So, what does Magnus do that no one is able to copy? Well, for starters, he's very unpredictable. And one thing with unpredictability is that you can never get prepared. And it doesn't matter what pieces you have. If you have the black pieces, Magnus can go for the craziest of openings. And even though sometimes he might give himself a bad start. He will wiggle himself back into the game. In the end, you know how it is all going to end. And let me bring up this cartoon. And you can pretty much put two and two together to be able to see who's most likely to win. And yes, this is Magnus, a gigantic Magnus with an enormous sword and shield. He uses a shield to fend for himself for when he seldomly gets attacked. But most of the time, he's the one who delivers the blows. And he does deliver those blows with such an ease. I can pick any game out of those 59. And I'm going to go for Carlsen's game against Anton Korobov. That was played in St. Petersburg on the 30th of December of 2018. Just to see how fast and what opening Magnus can go for. Magnus White got started with the D4 opening. And Korobov answers with the absolute number one response. And already from the second move, how many times do you get to see this come up? Nearly all the time. And Magnus uses that 1% to bring out the knight. When Korobov opened up on E7, Magnus pinned the knight, and when this attack followed, not takes, but simply 
the bishop is preserved. D6, C3, and when the bishop came under fire, this is where he escaped to. A narrow escape, but an escape is an escape. If there is a problem here for black, is that if he wants to castle, and I say he because we know it's a he, he might want to think twice if he wants to castle short. Korobov had a plan for what he did. He wanted this bishop out of the way and used the knight to pursue him. e4, bishop g7, and a normal bishop development. led to this knight to enter the game. With the ideas of getting the knight to reposition to a better outpost. Knight bd2 is how Magnus decides to move on. But let's stop here for just a second to look at Black's position. How well do you think his development is? And what do you think moves like e6 do? e6 is a perfectly legal response. And if you play the French, you also know what problems are associated with moves like this one. So what Korobov did here was to try and get some peace mobility going, but since e6 blocks the path of the queen side bishop, this is how Korobov responds to try and get this bishop to become slightly more active using the other avenue he has. Queen e2 could have led to this attack on the knight. And things can move very quickly into some complicated positions. If you don't want to go for a knight move, even if you attack the queen, after you remove the knight on f3, only then you will realise when the queens come off, bishop h4 is an outright blunder. If you attack the knight, which is a very playable option. The knight can either go north or south. And I think both are equally playable. Normally, you would want to aim for north rather than south. Coming back, Korobov, he'd go for b6 for a reason. So he got his bishop into the diagonal, and when the knight moved up the board, Carlson was setting up a trap. And this trap is all about this guy on d6. If you don't cover and go for a6, for example, if you go on to remove d6 with your bishop, the idea is that black would capture this bishop. And when the knight arrests d6 with a check after king f8, the knight can go on to remove the bishop from the left diagonal. But what would the score be after queen c7 or queen b8? Is the knight lost here? Not necessarily because there is bishop takes a6, but what is the problem here with a move like this? This is a problem, and black is right back into the game. You do need to hand back material, but what if we come back to this position right after the bishop eliminates this guy on d6. We assumed here the bishop is removed, but what if we attack either knight through g4 or b5? Let's try b5. If knight a5 just going to remove this bishop, and when this bishop comes off two, once the queen closes in on this knight, how does the knight escape? He can't. The best you can do here is to surrender him for the pawn on d6. And if we count what remains, white may not be that bad after all. But let's come back to see how Korobov did with the knight advancing to c4. This is how he answered. Knight back to d2, exposing the knight. Got the bishop to come off to the knight. And when Korobov went for this response, f4, and whatever you do, black would not want to castle short. Korobov ignores any threats this f4 poses and went after the knight. Takes and takes 
in this way, not wanting to open up the center. Led to the knight to move away from a defensive to an offensive position. And when this bishop returned to safety, Magnus challenged this bishop and it's all about how black responds here. You cover by getting the rook in. Do you go for long or do you take? I think Korobov went for the worst move here. So what did he do? He traded, allowing the knight to occupy a much better outpost. And if trading the bishops on e4 was bad enough, what do you think on this one? Korobov went on to attack this knight, but was there a real need to go after him? If you know this knight on e4 has no important squares to occupy, you also know he's not doing much as things stand. The knight returns south, and when the knight repositioned here, only now Magnus castles. But what side do you think he goes for? This is what he did, and probably Korobos follow up response was the biggest error in this game. That led to his immediate resignation. What did Gorobov go for? In two, one, and pause. I've covered this game in the past. So for those viewers who might have watched it, and for those who are watching for the first time, what is the move that is going to self-destruct black? If you spot it, you might be able to prevent white's next move. But if you can't see it, you will buy the farm. Okay, let me put this up differently. Can you afford to castle? And if so, what side? The answer is no. If you castle long, there is knight takes f5. And however you choose to reply here, a6 will come off with a check and black can pack it in and go home. Korobov didn't go for long, but for short. And when Magnus removed f5, this was also the moment where Korobov resigned. Korobov at the time of this game was eloed at 26.98. So what happens after queen d7? You can either go on to remove the bishop, or even a step better is to remove this pawn with a check. And after takes, takes, there is no way you will ever be able to keep up. And this young Magnus demolished Korobov in a game of only 21 moves. This was Magnus's shortest game, but it doesn't matter. Go for an error like this, and you will be punished. And this is Magnus Carlsen. Having won the 2019 Grenger, he's by far the highest elo chess player ever. During Grenger, he stood at 2845, and now we're looking at an even higher elo than that. And again, for the record, Magnus's highest elo ever stood at 2882 for classical games back in 2014, which is also the highest in history. So if Magnus Carlsen is not the true gladiator of chess. No one is. Okay, this was it for today. And there are some major chess tournaments around the corner. So until next time, this was your chess puzzler.